Nazism did not die in the ruins of Berlin in 1945, nor on the gallows at Nuremberg in 1946. It merely buried its uniform, slipped into mufti, and sauntered into the post-war world. Greetings from Prora, which is an architectural manifestation of Nazism's example to the future. There was no such thing as a Nazi style of building, but there was such a thing as a Nazi size of building, and it was vast, XXXL and then some. Prora was Europe's first industrialised holiday resort begun in 1936 and unfinished at the outbreak of war. So never inhabited by the 20,000 Aryan gods and breeder goddesses for whom it was intended. Its legacy is unmistakable. This is the prototype of the slummy hutches that were erected all over Europe 25 years later by the package tour industry. It was National Socialism that showed the entire continent how to trash its coastline. Specifically, it was the party's leisure organisation, Strength Through Joy. Strength Through Joy was the brainchild of the national cheerleader, Robert Lye, who named a cruise ship after himself and who hanged himself with a towel in his cell at Nuremberg. His big maxim was, there are no private individuals anymore. Lye's notion of leisure, for anyone other than himself, was compulsory communal games, compulsory communal walks, compulsory lectures in Germanic culture, compulsory communal gymnastics. All this suited the tragically obedient German people with their taste for all that is compulsory and all that is communal. It was a golden age for the joiner in, for the sycophant and the sneak. In many regards, the Third Reich was like a hearty, outdoorsy cadet club, a nationwide scout troop. Prora is a two-mile-long barrack. It illustrates Nazism's militarization of civilian life. In our retrospective abhorrence, we persuade ourselves that the Third Reich existed in a void, that it was culturally autonomous. In fact, Prora came out of international modernism and presages that movement's decline into soulless repetition. There was no unanimity on modernism among the top Nazis. Goebbels was sympathetic. Goering believed that small rooms weaken the race. There was, however, a uniquely German strain of architecture to which the entire regime was unequivocally opposed and which it killed off. The rampant individualism of Expressionism was abhorrent to a party obsessed by aesthetic control. Eric Mendelssohn's amazing observatory at Potsdam was built for Albert Einstein, who was subsequently to be denounced by the Nazis as a practitioner of Jewish science. This is some sort of marvel. It's a sculptural oddity. It was more or less completely without precedent and it's never been matched, save in the drawings of Frank Hampson for Dan Dare. This is what the future might have looked like had a tyranny not intervened. Mendelssohn, a Jew, got out of Germany. Dominicus Böhm, the Catholic ecclesiastical expressionist, did not. He attempted to come to some sort of accommodation with the new regime, not necessarily out of sympathy with it, but out of expediency, he had to make a living. He compromised himself to little avail. The audacity of his pre-1933 work is much diluted after that date. In a totalitarian state, there is, by definition, room for only a single faith. One people, one Reich, one God, one church. 
and that church was to be the National Socialist Church, which intended to replace the altar with cross swords and a copy of Mein Kampf. The worst seller, which became a bestseller after Hitler came to power and made him a millionaire within a year. The cross was to be replaced by the swastika. The German word for swastika is Hackenkreuz, literally hooked cross. So every time you saw it or said it, you were aware that the ubiquitous symbol of the Third Reich was a denial of the Christian cross, a perversion of it. The wholesale implementation of the National Socialist Church was never affected, but various liturgical amendments were made. For instance, the marriage orders were altered towards the end of the war to allow pregnant unmarried women who had lost the father of their child in battle to obviate the stigma of bearing an illegitimate child by marrying the helmet of the dead hero. Nazism turned nationalism into a sort of religion, thus welding together the two most belligerently pernicious tendencies of humankind. It peddled the idea of a new Germany that would reach the glorious heights of some mythic Germany of the past. Nazism dug deep into Nordic legend and Teutonic folklore and Aryan heritage. These cottages were erected simply as the backdrop for an annual Nazi pageant, representing the overthrow by doughty peasants of a despotic Archbishop of Bremen. The audience was invited to draw parallels between the spontaneous insurrection and the great National Socialist Revolution. This was also the decor for history in the making, for the stage management of the magnificent adventure of National Socialism. The word folkish signifies something more than folksy. It signifies that which grows from a particular patrimonial sod. It has connotations of tribe, breed and racial exclusivity. Folkischer building is inextricably bound in with Nazism's doctrinaire rationalism and its contempt for the idea of human progress. These reincarnated buildings are profoundly irrational. There was no reason in the 1930s to have built according to the precepts and plans of several hundred years before. There was no reason to have imposed the past on the present. It was even proposed that the nobly toiling neo-peasants should be obliged to wear heritage costumes to complement their heritage dwellings. Such costumes could be obtained mail order from the party's homesteading magazines. Anti-urbanism is at best crankish, at worst a springboard to horror. Like all reactionary hot air, back to basics, traditional values, that sort of tosh, it should be fit only to be mocked. ideologue of the lethal cracker barrel philosophy called Blood and Soil was this man, Walter Dare, born in Argentina, educated in England at King's College School, Wimbledon, 
a member in the early 20s of a succession of Back to the Land Brotherhoods and subsequently Reich's Minister of Agriculture and the SS's Chief of Race and Settlement. Darre's background was by no means atypical for a top Nazi. Hess, Rosenberg, von Schirach and, of course, Hitler all came from outside Germany. Germany was a magnet for malign cranks. It was a vessel into which they could pour their poison, in which they could turn wrong into right. The Holocaust's engineers did not believe they were doing wrong. They were acolytes carrying out a religious duty. If ever we need a demonstration of why we should never respect ideology or religious dogma, Nazi Germany provides it. The folkish movement politicised thatch and beams, just as the Nazi social Darwinism politicised biology and genetics. A twee thatch cottage of 1936 in England is a memento of a sweet, perhaps rather naive, suburban dream. A twee thatch cottage of 1936 in Germany is a memento of year three of the new order, an adult phraser of a monstrous inversion. This is where the 1100 SS doctors who worked in the concentration camps were trained. Nach unseren heutigen Erkenntnissen ist Aldrese ab 1935 die einzige Führerschule der deutschen Ärzteschaft gewesen. Betrachtet man sich die Lehrpläne dieser Zeit, Und, der, und das Dozentenkorps, dann kann man daraus schon entnehmen, was hier eigentlich gelehrt werden sollte. Es zieht sich also wie ein roter Faden die Thematik Euthanasie, Beseitigung unwerten Lebens, Rassenhygiene, Erbbiologie und in den Anfängen schon Entlösung Judenfrage durch das ganze Lehrprogramm. Das Ganze war verpackt in die Idylle dieses Dorfes, dieser Landschaft, in Sport- und Unterhaltungs Fragen am Rande und wurde von Anfang an getarnt durch eine Legende, die Legende vom Olympia Ruderer Dorf Deutschlands. The indoctrinatory process which turned the healing art upside down and which turned doctors into anti-doctors lasted 46 weeks, during which time the barbaric idealists were comforted, indeed encouraged, by this hallucination of the old Germany an old Germany which might be emulated by maiming and by murdering. At Ravensbrück, the Death's Head Corps, the SS, drove slaves and burnt bodies by day before retiring to their gemutlich houses to play cheerfully with their families, as though they had just done a normal day's work, which, of course, they had. Nothing that the supposedly decadent cities throw up has ever compared in evil to what happened in the small towns and boondocks of Germany. In the early years of this century, there grew up a weird collection of cults and brotherhoods, which combined primitivism, woodcraft, animism, nationalism and anti-Semitism. The Order of the New Templars, for instance, or the Germanen Order. In the wake of the morally catastrophic defeat in World War I, they fused together in the National Socialist Party, which was certainly nationalist, but hardly socialist and hardly a political party. It was rather a neo-pagan sect whose rights were to include a reinvented form of sun worship. This was built for summer solstice ceremonies. When Rudolf Hess flew to Scotland, Ian Fleming, then an intelligence officer and yet to become the creator of a series of Hitlerian villains, suggested that the only man to interview Hess was Alistair Crowley, the black magician and sometime initiate of the Order of the Golden Dawn, whose salute the Nazis had borrowed. Fleming was thus among the first to acknowledge that the Nazi government was an occult organisation. You have to imagine an entire nation taken over by Jim Jones or David Koresh or Luke Jure. Imagine the United States of America in which everyone is a member of the Ku Klux Klan.
Because it is cited at the conjunction of several of the fictions called ley lines, Heinrich Himmler believed that the Renaissance castle of Wevelsburg was the center of the planet. In 1934, he commandeered the castle and rebuilt it. This man who caused such untold suffering, of course, established his own concentration camp on the edge of the village in order to supply labor for these projects. The work was deemed too noble for Jews, so the camp was composed mainly of Jehovah's Witnesses. It was Jehovah's Witnesses then who were privileged to die personally for Himmler. It was Jehovah's Witnesses who gave their life in the glorification of the man who had enslaved them. This subterranean room was both chapel and crypt. Urns containing the ashes of the SS's highest initiates were to have been placed here. And this is where those initiates met and celebrated rites to fortify themselves in their exterminatory ministry. It's the most terrible place. It's disquieting, sullying even to stand where the genocidal zealot stood, empowering himself, multiplying himself through auditory trickery and mystical bullshit. There's evidence of this neo-paganism in backwards all over Germany. This is not a prehistoric site. Heinrich Himmler had four and a half thousand stones brought here to this former battlefield near Verden. They commemorate the Germanic chiefs slaughtered by Charlemagne. In 1936, Himmler conducted a solstice ceremony here. It celebrated the birth of the sun child who was born from the ashes of Christ. It was attended by 10,000 members of his Jesuitical order, the SS. He encouraged them to drop their baptismal names and to adopt pre-Christian Nordic ones instead. Himmler was a patron of exercises in racial pseudo-history and cosmic pseudo-science. He took particular pleasure in receiving arse-licking missives from concentration camp doctors detailing the experiments carried out at his suggestion. In this Gasthof, he entertained the scholars of the New Order, the parodic academics who reported to him in his neo-feudal fiefdom. This place renders agrarian kitsch sinister and corn dollies a prop of genocide. These are some of the projects undertaken by the ersatz scientists of the Deutsche Zannenerbe, the SS's ancestral research department. Uh, they show how far into a reason and credulous infantilism Germany had slipped. Eins! They sought to prove that Jesus Christ was an Aryan. This was an idea first posited by Richard Wagner, the patron composer of anti-Semitism. An archaeological dig in Tibet was intended to uncover the fossilised remains of a race of giants from whom Aryans were supposedly descended. Zwei! A scientist who went on to work at NASA under Werner von Braun complained that he'd lost two years of his career working with radar to demonstrate that the Earth is the inner core of another hollow planet. 
Himmler himself believed in reincarnation for Aryans only, in numerology, astrology, folk remedies, and homeopathic pest control. At the heart of Nazism, there were hippies in uniform. Even then, they were referred to as armed bohemians. Architecturally, too, the Nazis looked for ancestors. Hitler was an architectural dabbler whose initial enthusiasm had been for the Baroque. Magnificent prospect, isn't it? But under the influence of Alfred Rosenberg, another failed architect, he developed an obsession with ancient Greece and with the Greek revival of the early 19th century. He declared that the Germans were Nordic Greeks and that Greeks were Aryans. He had motifs from the Parthenon on his cutlery in order to symbolize his deep inner union with Greek antiquity. This devotee of symbolic teaspoons was also enthralled to Imperial Rome, because the Romans had been, yes, Aryan and Nordic. Furthermore, neoclassicism was also associable with the only period when German architecture had been preeminent in Europe. That was the period of Schinkel, of Speit, of von Klenzer. Neoclassicism is susceptible to giantism, and sheer size is something that Hitler valued over the niceties of style. It is also free of the hints of vulgarity that inform the Baroque, and Hitler possessed the watercolorist deference to middlebrow good taste. Von Klenzer's Valhalla was an important precursor, not only neoclassical, not only la... Not only neoclassical, not only grave, not only large, but a shrine to German heroes. Heroes such as King Heinrich, known on account of his love of birds as Heinrich the Fowler. This man was one of several of whom Heinrich the Faulest, Himmler, believed himself to be a reincarnation. Promoting the Lebensborn project for the breeding of pure Germanic stock, Himmler said, when conception takes place in a Nordic cemetery, the child will inherit the spirit of the dead heroes who are buried there. Lists of suitable sex cemeteries were published in the Schwarzer Corps, the SS's periodical. The German dead, it seems, are always with us. And Nazism was nothing if not a death cult. It glorified death, from which it promised return. It was fascinated by death. Its sanctioned murderers wore skulls. Its high priests killed millions, then killed themselves. Death was truly its speciality and its iconography is persistently morbid. Its neoclassical buildings are often funereal. They're like mausolea for the living. The living, in this case, were trainee tax inspectors. In whatever country it was found, this kind of neoclassicism was a dim, middle-of-the-road style. And so it remains, save in Germany, where it is contaminated by association. It is perhaps not impertinent to amend Hannah Arendt's memorable phrase and talk of the banality of evil buildings. And every building possessed a symbolic as well as a utile purpose. There was nothing complicated about this. Every building symbolised the state. National socialism was persistently vain. It existed in order to celebrate itself and to exhort its subjects to celebrate it. The German people were force-fed a diet of swastikas, eagles, vastness. Over and again, they were faced with exhortations in the shape of bloated statuary. 
It represented the perfected race that Germans were on the way to becoming, a race of imbecilic, genitally impoverished bodybuilders. How are they going to breed? Nazism was, however, as imaginatively wanting as it was morally deficient. Emulation could only be conceived of in terms of mimicry. Hitler was forever planning for eternity, but eternity was going to look like 2,000 years ago. enough. Albert Speer, the architect of the party grounds at Nuremberg and of much else besides, devised what he self-importantly pronounced to be the theory of the value of ruins, which was little more than the commonplace observation that great civilizations reveal themselves to the future through the remnants of their buildings, and that these remnants must thus be impressive and very big. And to achieve an impressive and very big ruin, you have to start with an impressive and very big building. What a theory. There can be no question that Speer built big, and he certainly impressed the hundreds of thousands of impressionables who attended the week-long September rallies in a state of impressed delirium. Like some priestly Busby Berkeley, he stage-managed mass mesmerism, mass enchantment and the central right of the party in which Hitler brought the blood flag of the Nazi martyrs into contact with all the other flags, in a gesture that has been compared with that of a cattle breeder inserting a bull's penis into a cow's vagina. Speer, though, has many devotees, the Speer carriers, the keepers of the toxic flame. Chief among them is one Leon Creer, a man who genuinely believes that Speer is the greatest architect of the 20th century. This is a piffling opinion and would be of absolutely no moment were it not for the fact that Creer is one of the chief architectural advisors to the Prince of Wales. It's useful to know where those dim populist opinions actually come from. Of course, Speer and his master never conceived that their great civilization would be so swiftly reduced to ruins nor can they have anticipated that those ruins would be treated with anything other than veneration, like those of Imperial Rome. They dreamed of immortality. The Congress Hall of the Thousand Year Reich is now a car pound, not much of a posthumous insult, but it's a start. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Welcome aboard the bus on our trip to the Eagle's Nest. Hansi and Lotta and Magda and Fritz never got to see Hitler's Eagle's Nest, the Kelstein House. This was as much a secret from the majority of the people as was Ava Braun. The road up to the Eagle's Nest is probably one of the most beautiful mountain roads in Germany and a great feat of engineering. It was built in as little as three years from 1936 to 1938. The tour bus commentary by Lord Hawhaw commends the speed of the road's construction but neglects to mention the word slave. The book neglects similarly to mention the word genocide but bangs on about the alleged crimes of the French regiment that liberated the place. But enough of that. Almost half a century after the end of Nazism, the official end, there is no unanimity about how to deal with the sites that were most holy to it. Whilst the party grounds at Nuremberg rot gracelessly, Hitler's mountain Erie has become a place of pilgrimage, of Adolf Olatry.
And from here, on the highest peak in Germany, he could survey his domain, lose himself in visions or whatever. It's like the lair of a creature that is more than human, a thunderous Nibelung, a Teuton god of war. It's also like the treehouse of a mad child who believes that he can rule the world. The contrary form of infantile protostructure is the burrow, the warren, the uterine comforter. The Reich's leadership was obsessed by them and built them long before war made them actually necessary. These dark labyrinths are associable with secret societies and with the desire of humans to take on animal form. In war, soldiers and civilians alike had no choice but to behave like beasts. They were forever forgetting to observe the chasm that separates animals from humankind. They doubtless took inspiration from Himmler's assertion that Germans are the only people in the world who know how to treat animals properly, and from their beloved Führer's dictum that the Aryan is closer to the animal than he is to the Jew. Eventually, the nation that conducted itself like a disgusting zoo was obliged to scurry and burrow and hide in the dark. This fortress in Hamburg housed up to 50,000 people bombed out in the wake of the Allied air raids. It did its job. Direct hits dislodged anti-aircraft guns, but the three-metre-thick walls and its four-metre-thick roof held firm. The Third Reich's few original buildings, those which are aesthetically rather than historically momentous, belong to the architecture of belligerence and desperate defence. Even more sculpturally plastic forms were employed in the occupied Western territories, notably on Guernsey. Of course, these structures are utile, but they're also patently, if perhaps unwittingly, representational. Their imagery is unmistakable. They recall masks and visors and helmets and chainmail fists. These concrete gun emplacements and watchtowers form a link between the expressionism that the Nazis feared and so destroyed and the concrete brutalism of the 60s and 70s. London no doubt owes its South Bank to the Third Reich. Because of the enormity of its crimes, and because of the extent of those crimes, and because of the moral squalor which infected it, the Third Reich is regarded as some sort of aberration. Twelve years when a supposedly civilised nation went mad. It soothes us to think of it thus. It has certainly soothed subsequent generations of Germans, this exculpatory myth of collective madness. Visit Dachau, the 1,200-year-old artist center with its castle and surrounding park offering a splendid view over the country. The concentration camp at Dachau was open three weeks after the Nazis took power. It was the first of 1,037 such camps. Almost every town in Germany had a concentration camp. The idea that the ordinary Hansi in the street didn't know what was going on is as much a lie as the great myth that every German saved at least one Jew. You have to ask, why did they save them if they didn't know what was going on? In addition to concentration camps, there were, by the end of the war, 7,000 forced labour camps. The Nazi regime was founded on slavery. Most of the buildings shown in this film were built by slaves. Here is the master builder Albert Speer, and here he is consulting with members of his workforce. Nazism's architecture 
is inseparable from the means of its construction. 32,000 people died in this place, starved, beaten, shot, experimented upon. It was, of course, not by its architecture, not by Speer's bloated temples, not by its creepy thatched cottages, that the 12-year Reich ensured that it would indeed last in human memory for the other 988 years. A German railway track entering a wood will forever mean mass death.